Have you ever heard someone say, so and so is living vicariously? Has that ever come across? Yeah, many of y'all have heard that. What that, what that means is that you're living life through someone else's experiences. It happens. It happens when parents try to live through their kids, especially when it comes to sports, right? Especially when it comes through, uh, to uh, little league sports. It happens, all right? And the way it happens is um, you, you see it's always fun for me to watch that one sports fanatic dad because on the sideline, you can tell he played sports. And he really wants his kids to play sports. And there's his little boy playing with dandelions. You know, he's over there making mud pies in the corner. And you go, and he's like, I didn't pay all this. And it's fun for me to watch. I don't know if it's for you or not. One time, my kids accused me and said, um, I don't know, one of the girls said, Dad, are you trying to live vicariously through us? I was like, no, I was far more disciplined and hardworking than that. Okay, just kidding, just kidding. I don't, not Abigail, actually, but anyways. Uh, but, but so where people are trying to live through someone else, and, and, and it happens. It happens uh, when you start identifying too much with a character in a novel. Uh, it, it happens when you identify with a TV show or some reality TV and, and, and that, that character and what they're going through, their emotions, you begin to identify with them. If they're having a great day, you're having a great day. If they're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. And sometimes even on social media, it can happen where, where people begin to desire what others have. They're living vicariously. And when you do that, it's not healthy. It's not healthy to live that way. It can put unrealistic expectations on others. It can make excuses for our own inadequacies and shortcomings. Oh, I am the way I am because if I had what they had, if, they had, if I had their life and if I had their health, if I had their money, it would be a very different story. We always try to blame something somewhere. And it can also create excessive dependence on others. You never truly realize the vision, the dreams that God has given to you. So living vicariously through others is not good in our daily lives. But what is wrong in our daily lives is actually right when it comes to our salvation. We are living vicariously through Jesus Christ. And we're going to learn that in our series. We're in this mini-series kind of going into the Easter season called Atonement. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and find Isaiah chapter 53. And here's the point. As you're finding chapter 53, verse 5, God's expectation of, of holiness is far beyond us. He is perfect. He is holy. His standard is very high. We are totally inadequate and we fall short of the glory of God. We are under condemnation. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. He is holy. We're not. But it's not because we sin that we are sinners. We, we are sinners uh, by nature. By nature, we are sinners. So the point is this. Only by completely depending on Christ and His sacrifice, we can make it. He took our vicarious punishment for the penalty of sin. He became our substitute. He stood between us and the wrath of God. So, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. As I mentioned last week, we're still in our series through 1 Peter called Together Forward. And we came to that section in chapter 2 where Peter was reminding the persecuted church that as they're going through their sufferings to follow the example, to trace the life and the mission of Jesus Christ, follow Christ, and to give them the example, the tracing sheet, he turned to Isaiah 53. He quoted from Isaiah 53. And so last week, we kind of began this mini-series called Atonement, kind of focusing on Isaiah 53 in light of Easter coming up and kind of delving into that in a little more detail. And the point I made is this. 
Isaiah 53 is much more than just a model on how to suffer. Yes, Peter is talking about that, but he understands that it's much more than that. It's much more than just a tracing sheet that I need to be more like Jesus when I suffer. Oh, when my family does crazy stuff or when when the world does crazy stuff, I need to suffer like Jesus because he suffered giving us an example. No, that's true. But this, Isaiah 53, is the foundation of our salvation. It is the core of what it means to be saved. And last week I began by kind of laying out the historical background of the book of of Isaiah to help you understand that God gave them that prophecy as they were living in exile, as they were living in bondage in in Babylon to tell them, yes, he's going to free them from exile, but he wants to really free them from sin. And hence someone was coming to take their place. That's Isaiah 53. This morning, as we go one step further, what I want to do in this message is to help you understand the idea of someone else taking your sin. Someone else paying the penalty for your sin. Someone else taking the wrath of God upon himself. Vicarious punishment. Jesus endured the punishment we were supposed to endure. And we couldn't. Here's a question for you. Can someone else stand in my place and take my penalty of sin? Do you understand what that means? Because that's the heart of our salvation. I can't do it. The standards are too high. I am dead in trespasses and sin. Sin has to be punished, and the punishment is death. For a little white lie, for your sin nature, the punishment is death. I cannot take that punishment, but someone else did. And that someone was Jesus. Question for you this morning. Has there ever been a time in your life when you asked Jesus to be your Savior? Now, I know you hear me say that all the time. What you're really saying is this. Jesus, I believe. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, but by faith, I accept that you came, the Son of God became man, lived a perfect, pure life, died on the cross for my sins and the sins of every human being, buried, rose again, and I'm trusting in you to be my substitute. You took the penalty of God's wrath upon yourself. And today I want you to be my Savior. He is the Savior. He's my Savior. And many of you as well. But if you've never come to that point where you actually prayed and said, Jesus, I want you to save me. You're still lost. You may be a good person, church-going person, loving person, kind person, conservative, patriotic. Man, you love to serve and you want to do things and give, but you're still lost. Because you're still standing on your own before the wrath of God and you will be consumed. You need someone to go between. And that someone is Jesus. If you've never done that, do it right now. You say, I don't understand. I have a lot of questions. We can answer all the questions, but you have no guarantee that you will see the next moment. You have no guarantee that you will see tonight. Make it today. Make it right now. A simple prayer that said, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior, and I always add, and my King. What that implies is this. If you did that for me, I will follow you the rest of my life. You're my boss. And help me to live for you from this day forward. And something else, before we dive in, our time is short. Are you living each day in gratitude for what he's done for you? You know, know, Christian life is marked by many things, but one thing it has to be marked by, gratitude. Someone took my place. Everything and anything that I have, I have achieved, is by His grace. I don't, I don't own anything. Family, health, church, business, whatever you have, is simply by His grace. He stood in my place. Gratefulness. So, be thinking about that for the next few minutes. We're going to understand the importance of vicarious suffering in the Old Testament. Now, the Germans called it Stellvertretung, which is taking one's place. 
Vicarious suffering is found throughout the Old Testament. Initially, it begins with hints, and then it's printed in big, bold letters. And then Isaiah 53, and then Jesus actually comes. So let's begin with the hints. Many hints right in the book of Genesis. In fact, right in Genesis chapter 321, after Adam and Eve sinned, listen to Genesis 321, as God came and cursed them, Adam, Eve, the serpent, but then he says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin. Whose skin? Not Adam and Eve's. The skin, skin of an animal. The Bible doesn't specify, doesn't go in detail, doesn't say the perfect lamb. God walked to the garden looking for a perfect lamb. None of that is said. Just simply he made tunics like a robe of skin and clothed them. Is given to us in a germ form, an embryonic form, just a little hint that they sin, curse came, sacrifice for the sins is going to come, but even now something has to die. Now, just, to, just like kids when they go to kindergarten, you don't start them off with calculus. <laughs> you don't start them out with organic chemistry. You don't start with, you know, we're going we're gonna, to um, uh, sentence diagram today. None of that. They're kindergarten. We start with ABC. That's ABC. Just enough for them to understand. They sinned. A terrible sin, by the way. Listen to the snake, serpent. But something had to die. But let's move along. Chapter 4, very next chapter. And Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Remember Cain and Abel, brothers. One is more a farmer type, the other is more the shepherd type. Cain brings an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Nothing wrong with the offering, except he didn't do the right offering, which was what Abel did. did. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but what about Cain? But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Again, they're in kindergarten. No long discussion about the importance of the blood sacrifice. And one day, Jesus, they would not have understood all that. So just enough to say, Cain, not that one. Just like we do with kids. When kids stick their finger in the electric socket, you don't explain to them how electricity works, do you? You simply tell them, okay, no, right? Do not touch that again. And they cry, they poke out their lip and say, that's okay, but I don't want you to do that. What did Cain do? Did he get it? No, he killed his brother. Keep moving along. Noah. Noah, you know the flood that came and because human depravity had gone out of control. They were inside the ark for over a year, but then in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, when he came out, God did not say, all right, guys, sin has been dealt with. Go out there and explore. Have a good time. Build cities and have many children. No, he, first thing Noah does is this. He built an altar to the Lord and took off every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. I mean, so if you think about it, when we studied Noah's Ark growing up in Sunday school, Bible school, whatever, it's not just two of every kind. They also took animals for offering, for sacrifice. And then listen to this. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the Im imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Which means this, okay, for now, with all the, all, the, the, the smoke rising up to the sky, God says it's okay, temporarily, because they've offered the sacrifice. But judgment still stands. Moving along, to, the, to Job, and, and, you know, when you talk about the book of Job, Job lived even before Abraham. So we're kind of jumping over to Job, not because it's in the book of Genesis, but because he lived before. And, and Job was a very wealthy man, as you know. He, he had a lot of kids, and the kids would get together, just like some of you have kids that get together. 
have a, have a you know, cookout, a grill out. Job's kids would do that. Nothing's changed. Isn't that funny? 5,000 years later, nothing has changed. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning. How many dads, if you're, if you're at that stage in your life where your kids are grown, at home with the grandkids, you get up and cook breakfast. You know, dad is a breakfast guy. You know, he would make breakfast to everybody. Job didn't get up and say, all right, what would y'all like, bacon or sausage? No. What did he do? He gets up in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Why? For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned, and curse God in their hearts, thus Job did regularly. Even Job understood the importance of sacrificing. And then, of course, we come to Abraham. You know, Abraham could not have any children. God gave him a son at 100 years of age. Sarah was 90. They have a child, and then God tests him, tests his faith, Abraham, take your son, your only son, go up on Mount Moriah and there sacrifice him. And Abraham goes, picks up the knife, and right at the last moment he is stopped. But listen, pay attention to this. It's not like God said, okay, Abraham, okay, 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 okay. I was just kidding. You pass the test. Go on now. Enjoy your child. No, it's like, wait. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket in a bush by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. That's where you, you now moved on from kindergarten. You're somewhere in middle school where you're talking about pre-algebra. You're beginning to sentence diagram. You understand the difference a little bit between you know, adjectives and adverbs and maybe a little bit of gerund thrown in there. Instead of his son, which means this, God was telling him, Abraham, your son was safe, but one day my son won't be. I will take his offering. You see, the point of all of this is such a beautiful imagery as, as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, God is giving him the picture of the coming substitute who will not be taken off the altar. In fact, he is going there once and for all. You see, right from the beginning, God was giving them hints constantly with Adam and Eve, with Cain and Abel, with Noah, Job, Abraham, and many others that you have to sacrifice. God is holy, you're not, and the only way you can stand before him, someone has to die. Animals, the lamb, the goat were sacrificed. But then we kind of move into high school. Now God begins to speak in big, bold letters what that means. In high school, you're no longer talking about just, you know, uh, triangles and different kind of triangles, the isosceles triangle, scaly. No, no. Now we're talking about pre-calculus. Now we're talking about participles and gerunds and infinitives. Now we're talking about big words, the organic chemistry and periodic table. Now God's going to go much deeper than that. This is the time for, a, uh, for God to set His people free. They are in captivity. They are in, in Egypt. And God sends Moses to set His people free. And the, and, and the big bold letter, the first place where we begin to see what this means about someone has to die for you is the Passover. Remember God sent nine devastating plagues. Water turned into blood. Frogs came over the land. Locusts, darkness over the land. All these things, but Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. But did you know, in every one of those situations, the Egyptians faced God's judgment. God's people were safe. Right? They had water. Frogs didn't come over their land. Uh, locusts didn't eat their crops. Their livestock was saved. There was darkness over Egypt. There was light over Goshen. Every step of the way, Egyptians faced God's judgment. People of 
Israel, the Hebrews were safe, except the last one. What was the last one? The death of the firstborn. What would happen? Listen to what God said. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all. This is not just Egyptian only. This is not just Pharaoh's son that will die. All. All? All the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. Remember this. We're going to come back to that in a few moments. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. What is the solution? Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, you see, now we're getting into trigonometry. Now we're beginning to read British literature and Western classics. You're, you're, you're getting more and more. You see how God has, God is so gracious. He did not drop all this on top of Adam and Eve and Job and Abraham. He built them up, brought them to a place where they began to understand, oh, blood? Yes. It has to be on the lintels, the doorpost of your house. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to strike you when, you st when I strike the land of Egypt. So the people had to go and paint over their doorposts, their lintels. I can imagine some, some wives telling the husband, can you please, is that going to come off? Can you take a little bit of blood and just apply in a corner somewhere where nobody can see and, and if, you know, check? Y'all know what I'm talking about. No, it's got to be. That, that doorpost has to be doused. That doorpost has to be painted completely with the blood of the Passover lamb. Now, why is it that they had to do it? Why is it that unlike the nine plagues, God said, no, you have to do this? Two reasons very quickly. One reason was this was a judgment against all the gods of Egypt that someone was going to die. But secondly, even the people of Israel, the Hebrews, participated in idolatry. Did you know that these very people, they're worshiping Egyptian gods and goddesses? See, we have such a distorted image. We think that in Egypt, before Moses came to set the people free, they were all like having prayer revivals and tent revivals and Bible studies. Some of them were. But most of them, you know what they were doing? They were bowing to the gods and goddesses of Egypt. They had images of false gods in their homes, in their lives. Let me read for you from Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 7. God is saying these words. He said, Then I said to them, Each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. Sometimes we think, you know, Moses was on Mount Sinai. The people are down here getting bored. And they say, Aaron, we want you to make us a golden calf. And Aaron's like, okay. That's not how it was. They knew what golden calves were. They knew about worshiping these false gods. It was natural. Because some of them still had them in their tents. Listen to what Ezekiel says. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. Then I said, God said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. You know what God wanted to do? He wanted to not only destroy Egypt, but also kill his own people. These people. Hence he said, I, I, I want to destroy you. But because of my name's sake, so my name would not be profaned before the Gentiles. I'll give you a solution. The solution is this. Kill the lamb and then apply the blood to the doorpost of your house. And when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over. That's where we get Passover. I'll pass over you. Which means this. Don't miss this. You are not exempt from this. The other plagues, yes, but this one, they were not automatically spared. They were also under the sentence of death. But even in more 
bold letters. God told them that someone has to go for you. Someone has to stand for you. And God told them that when he gave them his law. Remember Moses went up on Mount Sinai. He was up there 40 some days, right? Getting the Ten Commandments, but he was also getting the sacrifices, the system, the rituals, how to build the tabernacle, all this God was giving to him. And he came down, you know, the first time, broke the tablets, went back up, got another set, came back. But if you read the book of Exodus, they still didn't get it. They were still angry with him and bitter with him and mad with him. I mean, they, they, were, they were never satisfied. Remember that they were bitter and complaining and wanted to stone him and, and kept saying, we want to go back to Egypt. And so God kept working with them, and then he gave them Leviticus. Moses began to explain to them, there's a system, guys. Just because you left Egypt does not mean that now you're free. The God's not going to destroy you now. Oh, no. There is an elaborate system of burn offerings and sin offerings and special holy days that you have to keep so that God won't destroy you. And one of them was the Day of Atonement. What was the Day of Atonement all about? How many of you heard of that? Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement required two goats. It's there in the book of Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15. The first goat, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering. Who shall kill? This priest. He will kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, uh, uh, which is for the people, bring its blood, Remember now we're kind of getting into senior year of high school. You're headed into maybe workplace, college, whatever. You know, we're, we're going into advanced level classes. Bring its blood inside the veil. Adam and Eve were not ready for that. Abraham wasn't ready for that. Those people who were still in Egypt at the time were not ready for this. But now they are sort of ready for it bring its blood inside the veil and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, so he shall make atonement. The Hebrew word for atonement is the word kippur. Kippur is where you get the word kippur. Kippur means cover. Yom is day, kippur is cover, the day of covering. Isn't that beautiful? This is the day. And the first goat is, is sacrificed, the blood is applied to cover for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their, there's the word, sins. First goat has to be sacrificed. Now why is this sacrifice? God even tells them that. Keep listening to here. Uh, ver, chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now there are many discussions and arguments about is that the right translation? Is it not? But the more I study the Hebrew, the more I realize it is what it is. The blood has to be shed because that symbolized life for those people. Today we'll talk about brain waves and, and, and you know, all those things, but no, for them it was very obvious blood is shed, that person is going to die. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make, again the word kippir, atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul now you are in the last class hopefully it's not an elective this is the, the class you got to get it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul that's the first goat what's the second goat all about well the second goat is this i'll come back to that in a second the second goat was known as the scapegoat how many of you heard that before? Right? We, we, it's come from the Bible. It was called the goat of Azazel. Azazel means a rocky cliff, a rugged cliff. And what do you do with the second goat? You don't kill the second goat. The priest would put his hand upon that goat, symbolize, symbolizing the transference of the sins of the people upon the goat. The whole time they knew this was only symbolic. 
I mean, no goat can take your sins. Are you with me on that? Goats can't do that. We had a goat growing up. Only thing the goat could do was eat grass and garbage and then headbutt my grandma. The next day, next day, we, we had a great goat curry. I mean, it was great. It was wonderful. It was great. <laughs> you know, goodbye goat. Sorry if y'all have a pet goat. But there, here's was the goat for Azazel, the goat for the rugged cliff. They would symbolically do this and then drive the goat away. Go. Shh. What they're saying is this. One goat has died for your sins. The other goat has taken your sins away. What is God doing? He is preparing them to get the big prophecy that is coming in Isaiah 53. What is that big prophecy? And we're going to focus on that next week. Don't miss it. Where it's not going to be goat. It's not going to be year after year of going and killing goats and driving one in the wilderness. One person will intercede for the sins of others. One. One who is interceding will be sinless and righteous. The goat is just an animal. But this will be a person who will be perfect in all things. Jesus did not sin. Listen, Jesus could not sin. The act must be once and for all. Jesus doesn't keep dying on the cross. This is once and for all. The act, act must be voluntary. The goat had no choice in it. He was dragged there to the temple, to the tabernacle, and then killed. The act must be voluntary. The person has to choose to do this, and ultimately, God was behind the act. You see, God was preparing them. And we're going to focus on that in Isaiah 53 next weekend. Did people understand this? Just like I'm preaching to you right now, I believe some of you are getting it. Some of you are still confused. Some of you are distracted. You got other things running through your mind. Some get it. Some don't. Same way back in those days, some got it, some don't. Who got it? Well, people like David did, but people like Saul didn't. Remember Saul sacrificed? Jumped the gun, didn't listen to Samuel. And Samuel shows up, and, and he's like, look, look, I did all this. Listen to what Samuel told Saul. He said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings? Y yes, you should do that, but you, you mess things up. And sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. How many of you heard that before? That's where it's coming from. Samuel was not saying, Saul, don't sacrifice. He was saying, yes, you should, but make sure your heart is right. And to heed means listen to God, then the fat of rams. So Saul didn't get it, but who got it? David. Remember David? Man after God's own heart did some horrible things. What did he do? He, killed uh, he, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, killed her husband, tried to cover up the sin. And God sent Nathan the prophet and said, you are the man. And David now is in distress. And he goes before the Lord and he repents. You know, the, the horrible things are happening. Son dies, the baby dies. And then he listened to Psalm 51. This is, if you truly want to repent, this is a prayer you need to read. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. He is the king. How many goats, how many lambs do you want, God? 10,000? 20,000? No problem. 10 for Bathsheba, 10 for Uriah. There you go. No. David gets it. You do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. He says, I don't understand. Sometimes my dad would say the same thing. It's like, he said, I don't like David in the Bible. I was like, why, Dad? Because I don't get it why God loved him so much. He said, I do get it, but I don't. This is why God loved him. He had a broken spirit. He did some horrible things, and yet he was a bro had a broken, contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. 
Saul didn't get it, David got it. And down through the centuries, God had to keep telling the people, yes, you need to sacrifice, but watch your heart. Listen to what God said in Amos 5.21. Amos, by the way, lived before Isaiah. He was from Judah, but prophesied to the people of Israel to the north. I hate This is God speaking. I hate, I despise your feast days. I hate your Christmases and I hate your Easter's. And I hate your Thanksgiving. I hate them all. And that's something. What if God were saying that to us? And I do not savor your sacred assembly, your church meeting, your worship services. I can't stand them. What in the world? Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offering, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. So here comes a family. Man, they're wealthy, or they've saved it up, and they got this big, fat ram. God says, I can't get it out of here. Is God having a bad day? Oh, wait, listen to what it says. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Your worship... It nauseates me. Wow. Why, God? Why are you so angry? Well, listen to this. But let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream because you're doing a lot of things contrary to my law. And yet you think doing sacrifices will cover it up. They're simply to remind you this is what you need to stand before me. But someone is coming. By the time of Isaiah, God was pretty angry, talking to the southern kingdom. Listen, by the way, going back to uh, Amos 5, 25, very quickly. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried Sekut. By the way, Sekut was, was a false god. Can you imagine that? There is Mount Sinai, uh, there is Moses, the glory of God, the tabernacle, the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, and they had false gods tucked in here and there. Oh, we don't have any false gods. I mean, there are no idols here. Anytime anything becomes more important than God, that's your false god. Wait. Anytime you begin to fear something more than you fear God, if only we hated sin as much as we hate the virus. If only we feared God more than we fear the pandemic. You say, that's serious. This is serious. Your idols, the star of your gods for which you made for yourself. But now Isaiah, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed cattle, but I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. What if God is saying that to us today? I can't stand them. Now here's where it gets worse. Listen to verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. Now I take prayer very seriously. Somebody tells me to pray, and if I commit to praying for you, I'm praying for you. And I'm getting on my knees before God, and I'm repenting of my sins, and I talk to God. There's no put you on a prayer list. I don't get into the business of, we're going to have a prayer for you, and, and uh, man, we're all praying for you. Or, no, no. If, if I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. And it's serious business. And God answers my prayers. I'm not being presumptuous. I'm not being proud. But God answers those kind of prayers. Sometimes God may not give what I'm asking for, but He gives even better than what I'm asking for. But if you have sin in your heart and you have bitterness in your life and you, you are doing things that are not right, listen, your prayers are hitting the ceiling and coming right back down. I can't help you there. 
You are in the way of your own prayers. God says to them, though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. When you should actually have the blood applied to your heart, your hands are covered. It means you're doing evil. You're sinning. Verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to be evil, to do evil. Do you understand how much God is holy and how he hates sin and how the punishment of sin is death? But Jesus came. He stood for us. Listen to Isaiah 53, 5 again. We began with this one. He was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. You see, the vicarious punishment. He is the substitute. God will punish sin in the individual or the substitute. If you are the individual, you will die in your sins. And by his stripes, we are healed. See, that's what the cross is all about. That's why this morning, if you do not have a substitute, the wrath of God is hovering over you. Now, by the way, very quickly, Jesus' death on the cross has many other meaning that Christ conquered the grave, uh, Christ uh, defeated sin, Christ is victorious, a lot of things, but at the heart of it is the fact that he took the penalty of God's wrath upon himself. He stands for me. And it's only through him I can have forgiveness, eternal life. If today you're here and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you're a good person, nice person, I love you and I know you love me, but you're still lost. You're standing wide open before God and the cloud of His judgment and His wrath is hovering over you. Yeah, I, need to, I need to come talk to you. I need to get this straight. You do not have the guarantee that you will see lunch today. You have no guarantee that you will see next week, next month. The wrath is just hanging over you for it is appointed for men to die once and then there is the judgment. Someone came in between and said, I got this. And all you have to do is receive him as your savior and your king. Oh, I'm saved. I'm, I'm good. I prayed the prayer years ago. Man, I, I love the way you put it though. I love it. I love it. But I, I've all done all that. You know what happens when you truly understand this gospel? You cannot help but be grateful. It's like this. If I was standing in a court of law before a judge's bench, and there I am standing, and my, my punishment is capital punishment, you will die. Execution. And as the deputies are coming to take me away, and I, I know it's over, it's done. No more appeals. It's over. Someone stands up and says, excuse me, judge, I'm going to die for him. Oh, no one can die for anybody. Yes, I can. Here are my papers. Here's the authority that is given to me. I will die for that man. And as I'm watching this happening before me, the man comes and gets into the stand. He's standing there. I am shocked. I'm blown away. I'm in uh, disbelief. Why, why would you do that? Because I love you. But, but they're going to kill you. Right. I'm dying for you. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you would say that? Thank you. What do you want me to do? How, how do I live? 
Because, because my life is now a gift. Every single moment that I have is a gift because you are taking my punishment of death. Show me a Christian that has stopped being grateful. They become bitter because of their own bitterness or because of somebody has corrupted them. Because, listen, there's a disconnect when it comes to the gospel. Are you saying I'm not saved? I can't say where you are or you're not. But bitterness has come in the moment you stop being grateful. I am the pastor of this church, but I don't deserve it. I have a wonderful family. I have four wonderful kids, but I don't deserve them. Everything I have is a gift. When you stand up here, no matter what you do, whether it's worship time or, or you're sitting there or you're serving, it is a gift. How dare we stand before God and say, this is not right and that's this and that's that. How does that happen? How does that compute in your mind? The devil will work on you because he works on me. He'll come to me time to time and say, you know, you know, they don't appreciate you like they should. I'm not lying. If they only knew how much you did, if Nicole only knew how much you do for her, if only your kids were more appreciative, if only your church would really know what all goes behind the scenes. Now, so-and-so said that about you, I'll tell you what. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? And here's the sad thing. I actually believe it for a while. And when you start believing, you go. And then here's the worst part. And you want to you wanna pass on that burden to somebody else. Nicole is the best one, you know. But I've learned a long time ago, don't give that junk to her. She's mean. <laughs> like, Oh, it's not them. Kids, I don't want to spoil their day. But once in a while, you can do that too, you know. Just get angry and, and, and you know, overreact. They do this, but you're here. You see, what you're doing is you're passing on a burden to them that only he was meant to carry. And the whole time, the enemy is sitting back there and saying, job's done. Gratefulness says, I don't deserve anything. The breath I have, the heart that is beating, the pulse I have, everything that I have, and then eternity forever and ever is because of Jesus Christ, because of Him right there. The Lamb who died for my sins and then took my sins away. 